Hey, I'm Josh, and this is my heterosexual life mate, Silent Josh, and we're teaming up this week to bring you a comedy timeline of Kevin Smith's View Askewniverse. That's right, with Jay and Silent Bob's reboot coming up, we figured about time to uh, check out the timeline of this whole series, starting from Clerks, um, and interweaving, basically following any of the films that Jay and Silent Bob were in. And let's see if it makes any sense. What do you think, dude? All right. We kick off back in 1994 with Clerks, Kevin Smith's first feature film made for less than $30,000. We meet Dante, who wasn't even supposed to be there today, and right off the bat there's an issue of Soap Opera Digest that's from April 1993, so that seems like our year, I suppose. We're then introduced to Jay and Silent Bob, small-time drug dealers, and big-time studs. And Dante's girlfriend Veronica, and somewhat importantly, Willem. And he looks like this. And he's one of Veronica's lucky 37. 37? We then meet Randall, Dante's friend, and he's a wacky, wisecracking foil to Dante's straightforward everyman. And we also meet Olaf. In this scene, we can see a TV guide. And it's also from April of 93. And then a short while later that same day, the magazines change, although both issues are still from April of 93. Dante says this. You ever notice that all the prices end in nine? Oh really, Dante? Well, how about all of these? Then this rack of magazines features a People magazine from April 93, so there's, there's kind of no doubt now. This is uh, April of 93, and holy crap, it's Gore Zone magazine. So there's hockey, and then we find out that Julie Dwyer died, and she died yesterday. And Randall then says it's 4 o'clock on a Saturday, even though Veronica is in class all day, and she earlier told people to go commute, which would they most likely wouldn't do on a Saturday. We meet Rick Darris, who Jason Mewes claims is Jay's older brother, although that's never confirmed in any of the films, as well as Heather Jones. We then meet Caitlin Bree, Dante's ex, who ends up traumatized after having sex with a dead guy. It's complicated. And Silent Bomb finally speaks words of wisdom. Those damn magazine covers change again, and People is still from April of 93. And it's a cover about the death of Brandon Lee, which I just covered in my Crow timeline, so just go watch that if you haven't already. Dante and Randall fight it out, and then they close up, and then Dante is randomly shot and killed. Okay, so that, that scene was cut out and never actually happened. But that was the original ending, and we get a promise that Jay and Silent Bob will return in Dogma. Well, that would happen eventually, but first we had to go to 1995's Mallrats, and I used the 10th anniversary version, which kicks off at the 37th annual Governor's Ball and introduces Yondu, and he says they're doing a live game show at the mall this coming Saturday. We also meet his daughter and her boyfriend T.S., who is no Joe Black, and I should point out that in the regular cut of the film, there's a totally different and informative scene. In it, we find out that their friend Julie Dwyer, first mentioned in Clerks, died, and she died last night. So since Clerks said she died yesterday, this most likely takes place on the same day. And then we meet Earl and Brenda. <coughs> Quick note, before this film, Jason Lee was a professional skateboarder. They break up just like T.S. and Brandy did, so T.S. is the uptight kind of straightforward man, and Brody is his unleashed id with no filter. So basically, Dante and Randall. There's a Tremors poster, so we're post-1990, and they, and they pass the quick stop, but the shutter's up, so it doesn't seem like the same day, does it? And Brandy says the game show is tonight, so I guess it's Saturday, which I guess lines up with the clerks being on Saturday. And if you were sitting around wondering where you could see Michael Rooker's butt cheeks, here's the place. They head to the mall and meet Batman, and I guess it's around Easter, so it's still April of 93. And then we re-meet Willem, who looks a lot different than before since he's been recast as Earl's Randy. Jay and Bob are back, and hey, aren't, aren't they supposed to be standing outside the quick stop all day? So the general consensus is that Mallrats takes place one day before Clerks, and Randall is mistaken when he says that Julie died yesterday. 
Complicating things a little further is the comic book called Clerks of the Lost Scene, written by Kevin Smith. It's considered to be canon, and it shows a notice for Julie's wake stating that the date is April 15th, 1994, so, you know, my birthday. Which would then place Mallrats on the 14th, which would be a Thursday or a Friday, so, um, not Saturday at all. And then we meet Trisha Jones, teenage sex researcher and younger sister of the last film's Heather Jones. And she shows her sex notebook, which shows us March. There's no entries past the 21st, so unless she didn't do any more research that month, it's possible that we're set in late March. The days of the week also line up with 1995, so that doesn't make sense with Clerks being in 93. She banged Affleck yesterday. So if she's on the right month for the log, it's March 22nd. Since the last entry was March 21st, which again doesn't line up with like anything at all. This here's Gwen and TS says that she had sex with Rick Darris, linking it to clerks again. They get some topless clairvoyance from Three's Company's Terry, and then Jay and Bob are at a bookstore in front of a bunch of magazines from 1995, so that throws more confusion on our time frame. And then, oh man, how long is it going to be until I can see Stan Lee in a movie and not feel depressed? They try to stop the game show that Brandy's in and Dante shows up, although he's a new character here named Gil Hicks, and according to Kevin Smith, he's Dante's identical cousin. Brandy and TS reunite, as do Renee and Brody, and Affleck gets taken down by a videotape with a minor, which is weird because she's researching a book for a major publishing company and she's underage and videotaping. And I guess that they're saying it constitutes as child pornography, which is weird again because her research is endorsed by the publisher and there's consent forms and everything for multiple videotapes that she's done, so doesn't that involve the company in a sort of a child porn ring? Knowing she's 15 then makes the scene really extra creepy. Although I guess we're supposed to think it's funny. Silent Bob quotes Yoda, and in the extended cut, Jay makes it seem like it's the first time he's heard him speak. We get info on what happens to the characters, including TS and Brandy getting married, and Jay and Bob with a monkey. So where do we stand with the date here? Well, if you ignore the magazines and clerks, and disregard Trisha's book saying March, we can place this on April 14th with Clerks being on the 15th, but bump it to 1995, which would line up with Clerks saying it's Saturday, and then we can ignore the Saturday comment from Mallrat since it was only in the extended cut anyway. Also, Easter Sunday was on April 16th in 1995, so that kinda lines up. We also get another post-credit promise saying Jay and Silent Bob would return in Chasing Amy. And they did in 1997's As Promised Chasing Amy, and we get some dates right away. We see Affleck and Lee again, but they're both new characters now, listed as Banky and Holden, and they're comic creators who first get press in July of 1994, which would have been before the first two films. There's more stories from May 95, which says their comic Blunt Man and Chronic, based on Jay and Silent Bob, will debut in early 96. More news from March 96 goes by, and we head to a comic convention which I'm assuming from this CBG cover is in the spring of 96 as well, and Willem 2 is there. But it's most likely a new character. And then this creepy guy shows up right here. So in case you were wondering, Holden is a kinda uptight straightforward man, and Banky is his unleashed id with no filter, so basically Dante and Randall and TS and Brody. I mean, Banky and Broder are even played by the same guy. We also meet Alyssa Jones, sister to both Trisha and Heather, and clone of Gwen from the last movie. And they go to a club with this poster promoting a show on Sunday 421, which lines up with when that date fell in 1996. She says she's friends with Clerk's Caitlin Bree and that she was at Julie's funeral, which would have been a year ago then. Turns out Alyssa likes girls and not Holden. And when they're all telling sex stories, we find out that Banky used to date Brandy from Mallrats. Brian O'Halloran returns as yet another Hicks, this time Jim, and he's with the talented Mr. Ripley. Time passes, Holden and Alyssa become close, and when he reveals his love for her, she proudly declares that she's gay. But then, like 10 seconds later, makes this sound. 
and I guess is cured of, of her gayness. I mean, I, I get that she's not really gay and she's actually bisexual, but she hasn't been portrayed that way up until this point, so it kind of, I don't know, this, this one didn't age well. We pop back to the quick stop to find out that Rick Darris and Koei here had sex with Alista at the same time and she's not the virgin Holden had thought. She even reveals that she had sex with Shannon Hamilton, so I guess she had sex with two different Afflecks, and also had a threesome which involved Gwen Turner, which would be a real trick since Joey Lauren Adams played both characters, so she technically had sex with herself, but then again, I mean, who hasn't? Finally, Jay and Bob appear and they say they stopped going to the mall years ago, but it's more like one and a half years, and Holden pays them likeness rights money, and Bob of course talks and gives some good advice, and then they're headed to Chicago. Holden basically ignores that advice and instead suggests that he, Alyssa, and Banky all have sex together. This of course does not go over well. And we cut to one year later, so we're in 1997 now, and Bluntman and Chronic is over, and Banky has a new book. Alyssa's doing well, and Holden made a book based on their relationship, and they part ways. We end with a new promise that Jay and Bob will be back for Dogma. The promise was kept this time as 1999 saw the release of Dogma, which kicks off with the sadly passed Rufus, and another Hicks sibling making a cameo on TV. But then we meet Loki and Bartleby, who are just hunting for a little goodwill. There are fallen angels who hatch a plan to go back to heaven, and this article seems to suggest that we're in 1998 here, unless it's an older article. We meet Bethany here, as well as the bowler, and this newspaper shows us that it's March and Jason Lee is back, but is Azrael now a demon? Snape appears as the Metatron, and he enlists Bethany to stop Loki and Bartleby and teams up with Jay and Silent Bob, who are apparently prophets, and three movies later, Randall finally shows back up again, but as a totally new character. Jay and Bob recap why they're in Illinois, although you can read the whole story in a comic book spinoff called Chasing Dogma. That book reveals that they were living with Trisha Jones for at least six months and then traveled leading into the events of this film. This tour planner back here cements that we are in 1998 and then Chris Rock appears as Rufus. But hey, there's already a Rufus in this movie. Psalm Hayek pops in to make the audience pop up and then there's um, a, ooh, a poop monster. There's more 1998 posters up, and when Silent Bob talks, it's to quote Indiana Jones. No ticket. There's the big revelation that Bethany is blood relative of Jesus himself, and then there's this newspaper cements this as being on April 15th, 1998. Again, my birthday. And they head to the church and cause chaos, while Bob kills Azrael with a blessed golf club. Bartleby kills Loki and Jay accidentally removes his wing which makes him human while Bethany figures out where God is, and God is the computer from Electric Dreams. And if you haven't seen that movie, you are missing out. You should probably do a reheated turkey on that or something someday. And they restore him, but it's actually her because God is Alanis Morissette, and that's not ironic either. Her voice destroys him, which is kind of the same effect that Jagged Little Pill has on me, and then she restores everyone to life and fixes everything. Hey, good thing that God did that for the Holocaust as well, or, well, any other tragedy ever, I think. But, but I, I guess that those ones had to happen, but this tragedy, well, yeah, yeah, this one we can reverse. Turns out that Bethany is pregnant, and I guess it's a virgin birth, and hey god, maybe ask the person before you spontaneously give her a child. It's kind of invasive. Everyone goes back to heaven, and Jay and Bob say that they should get back to Quick Stop, so the credits promise that they'll be back in Clerks 2, Hardly Clerking. In 2000, there was also the Clerks animated series, which ran for one season and only had six episodes. It featured Dante and Randall at the quick stop, and it's kind of questionable if it's in canon or not, but it definitely takes place just a short while after the original Clerks film. Also in 2000, Jay and Silent Bob popped up in Scream 3. 
guess it's possible to consider this appearance canon and part of the duo's trip to Hollywood in the following film, but uh, I'll still admit that it's pretty weird and kind of out of place. So around this time, Kevin Smith was growing tired of his own universe and decided to close it out with 2001's Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. It kicks off in the 70s at the Quick Stop and the video store is previously a record shop. And we meet Baby Jay and Bob, then flash to the present. And the boys are back at the stop. And apparently the shutter door is stuck again. Randall's back and so is Dante and they take out a restraining order to keep them away. Brody pops back up and I guess he quit his Tonight Show job and now owns a comic store and the comics on the wall are all from 2001. So it seems like we're in real time Damn. 01 here and three years have passed since Dogma. He tells them that there's a blunt man and chronic movie being made, so they go see Holden, and he introduces them to the internet and internet trolls who are saying negative things about the BNC movie. So they head to Hollywood to stop the movie, and then they get a ride from a princess, and then from the Scoobies, and Fred is Riley. Then they meet up with a team of women consisting of Nadia, Faith, Clear Rivers, and um, Kevin Smith's wife? I don't know, is it is it tacky to just include your hot wife in things? I mean, is it just, is it like bragging? What, what do you think? Stifler's here too, and they turn out to be pulling a heist, in black cat suits no less. And the boys steal a monkey and end up on the run. Now, if you read the Chasing Dogma series, there's an issue that's basically these same events, but pretty different. So you can either just assume that it's a comic book and not canon, or I guess just ignore that single issue. Jon Stewart pops in, and this playboy here is from May 2001 also, and they're hunted by Ron Burgundy and John Bender. And this car has registration stickers in red, which matches California's colors for 2001 also, and Bob does his required talking. Tracy Morgan appears, and then they get to the studios, and Ben and Matt are here actually playing themselves this time, making Good Will Hunting 2. And here's where we get our official date confirmation, with this clapboard showing the date as March 21st, 2001. Damn. There's a Scream scene in here, I guess paying off the whole Scream 3 thing, but it's Wes Craven making Scream and not Stab. So the Scream 3 bit is... I guess not in continuity, since Stab and Scream are two different universes. Here's the first big screen version of Daredevil, and the film version of Jay and Bob is Biggs and Vanderbeek. The guys suit up in costume with Chris Rock as the director and Randy as his assistant, and Jason Lee shows up again as Banky this time, and then the real kicker. Mark Hamill appears as the villainous Cockknocker, and everything comes to a head with the police and the girls. Justice goes to jail, and the movie premiere shows Dante, Randall, Willem, Alyssa, and little sister Trisha, Hooper X, and he and Banky are a couple now, and it all ends in a party to close this universe out as the end credits tell us Jay and Bob have left the building. Well, that lasted all of five years because in 2006, Kevin returns with Clerks 2, which brought Dante back to the quick stop but it burns down. Randall's here too, and they're forced to get jobs at Mooby's fast food joint. Dante is engaged and leaving tomorrow to move to Florida, and of course Jay and Bob are hanging out here now. And hey, Willem too is here, but again, a totally new character. Randall's on a website advertising HugCon 2006, so we're most likely in 2006, or I guess 2005 if they're advertising early. Dante's fiance is Kevin's wife returning, playing a new character herself, and Affleck pops in as yet another character, also unrelated to any of his others. And Kevin... Kevin... How was directing this slow zoom of your wife kissing your friend? We're introduced to new character Elias, and then new character Becky, who's very dawson and it's obvious that her and Dante have some flirty thing going on, and they apparently had sex once in the back room. We see Dante's wedding invitation for January 07, and Emma says it's still three months away, so we're set in late 2006 then. 
Next up, a visit from Jason Lee playing new character Lance, and the boys go go karting because a fast food place with a crew of apparently only four people can operate with two people just up and leaving for a while at the same time. Wanda Sykes is here, and Becky teaches Dante to dance, and Kevin Smith teaches the world to basically just fall in love with Rosario Dawson. It turns out that Becky's pregnant, so they both leave, again, leaving only two employees in the store, because again, for some reason, there's only four employees in total to run an entire restaurant. They get together, but Emma sees, and I don't know, are we, are we supposed to sympathize with Dante and Becky here? He cheated on his fiancée, who was only shown to be loving and supportive, and he did it unprotected, no less, so you know. Team Emma right here. Randall says Julie's funeral was like 10 years ago, which was 1996, and Clark's was 95, but he says like, so it's an approximation, but makes me feel better about 95 with that one instead of 94 or 3. Bob does his required talking, and the boys decide to buy the quick stop themselves, and Dante and Becky get together because, you know, he's not going to cheat on her or anything like he did Emma or Veronica. Okay, I guess he didn't cheat on Veronica, but he was trying to. It apparently takes over a year to buy the shop since they stamped the deed on December 17th, 2007. And I guess they had to pay dues to Disneyland? And wait a minute, is, is Becky pregnant here? I mean, first of all, this is the longest pregnancy in history. Unless they're on their second kid by this point? I mean, she shouldn't be on this ladder anyway, but it's likely that they were supposed to sign the paperwork in December of 96 instead of 7. And this is a couple months later now, with Mecky about six months along as they reopen the store. The credits tell us that Jay and Bob may return, but not for a while. So in 2013, they snuck out Jay and Silent Bob's super groovy cartoon movie, which starts with an animated duo, and important to note that this is not in continuity and is simply an adaptation of the Blunt Man and Chronic comic book release to tie in with Jay and the Silent Bob Strike Back and tells us how they became superheroes. Introduces their villains, including Cockknocker, although not played by Mark Hamill here, and instead voiced by Tara Strong. Instead of ending with the death of Blunt Man, as happened in the comic, and instead introduces Blunt Girl, and ends with a Stan Lee voice cameo. This one's not in continuity, so it's not an official part of the timeline, but if you really want to know when it takes place, Doc Brown's license plate, Places in 2013. The duo also appeared in lots of music videos and some short films, and also sort of appeared in 1996's Drawing Flies, although those entries aren't really a part of the greater Askewniverse. So that brings us to 2019's Jay and Silent Bob reboot, bringing the pair back to the big screen for the first time in 13 years. We can see Quick Stop in the trailer, although the video store seems to be a chicken sandwich shop, because I guess uh, there's no video stores anymore. And oh my god, do the boys look old here. Banky's back, and they're rebooting Blunt Man and Chronic with Supergirl and Batman Dose, and it's basically a celebrity cameo-a-thon, although Justice is back, and Jay has a kid who's actually Kevin Smith's kid, and if it's set in present day, she'd have been born in 2002 or so, so I guess she's 17 and it's kind of a repeat of Strike Back with them heading to Hollywood to stop a movie. Looks like Damon is back as Loki, even though he died. Holden's back. Becky's here, I guess, although there's no sign of Dante or Randall so far, but I'm pretty sure they're going to be in there somewhere. So there you have it, it's six movies, it's about to be seven. Kind of curious to see where the reboot takes things um, and if it leads into Clerks 3 or if we're never going to see that. There apparently was a script at one point, that, but Jeff, who plays Randall, uh, didn't want to do it because he said it was too dark and depressing. Um, so they scrapped it and Kevin actually went to the drawing board to rewrite it. Um, they, they say it's going to happen, so I guess we'll see if it does happen or not. Continuity-wise, these actually work pretty well, uh, at least character-wise, date-wise. It's a lot of stuff that's all over the place. I know that like a lot of the magazines, you kind of, you, I guess, can't really keep as a as a hardcore indicator, but there's a lot of other things in there that, that, that space it out. 
Um, I have a feeling that there's going to be some uh, arguing about this down in the comments about people telling me that I'm wrong on this day and, and they should really stick with the 1994 date um, that they used in the comic book because uh, that's supposed to be canon, but it, it, it just doesn't make sense to me, so I'm sorry. This is what I'm going with. Um, but let me know what you think of that. Let me know what you thought of the Kevin Smith movies in general. Um, I enjoyed I enjoyed all of these. Some of them didn't age well. Um, some of them felt very dated and were not as good as they remembered it. Um, I very much still enjoy the original Clerks. Um, I, I always get a kick out of Mallrats. Mallrats actually feels very bad movie-ish, but it's still a lot of fun. Um, Chasing Amy was the weak link of the group. That one was the one that stuck out to me as not being as good as I remembered it. Dogma was pretty fun. Dan and Bob, a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I, 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 I got a real kick out of them. Clerks 2 was actually pretty good. Um, you could sort of see Kevin Smith on his downward slide. I haven't been a big fan of Kevin Smith of late. Um, his movies really slid down a little bit. They're still watchable. Um, and enjoyable. I mean, I, I thought his last couple were entertaining, but they're just not really um, as good as they used to be. So I'm really looking forward to the reboot, and hopefully it'll be a return to form, because I feel like that he does his best work when he's in the Askewniverse. Um, but again, let me know what you thought down below. I want to know your comments on this. Um, subscribe to the channel, of course. Give me your likes. Um, give me your Patreon um, support over here. Check out the Patreon page. These guys do, and they're awesome. Um, this was a pretty long one, so thanks for sticking with this video. Um, a little bit lengthy. A lot of great stuff planned up for you in the month ahead. We're about to go into Halloween Overdrive, so get ready. Get buckled in. And I'll see you next week for, for another, another great video. Thanks, guys.